Thank you very much. That's a very kind introduction. Um, I don't know that I uh, uh, deserve the, the, the term prophet, um, uh, and I don't think I will we'll share anything with you that's prophetic, but I hope uh, perhaps that there might be some aspect of revelation to it. Um, uh, uh, and, um, and it's not the uh, kindest or gentlest um, uh, uh, revelation, uh, some of what I'll talk about in terms of our shared history as Americans, uh, but I hope that... Uh, uh, so I will afflict you a little bit uh, with some of that, uh, with that revelation, but I also uh, will try to talk some about uh, what drew me to write about these things and have an interest in these things um, and how it might be that, uh, that other people would contemplate them and, and maybe what they might mean for the, uh, for the world that we live in today. Uh, so not necessarily just a, a journey into the past. But thank you again for having me, and I particularly appreciate uh, the arrangement of the balmy weather. Uh, and the, uh, when you're going to speak at a church and the weather turns against you, you have to question if, that, um, uh, if someone is paying attention and isn't glad about it. But, um, uh, but I hope that's not the case. Um, as I prepared for my journey here, I, I started off this morning in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, but as I prepared for this trip, over the last few weeks, I, I often thought about uh, what a good time it is to be back out uh, with audiences like this one and a few others that I'll talk to over the next couple of months uh, who care about some of the issues that I care most about at a time when, regardless of our political party allegiances, uh, the re-election of President Obama, the implications of November's vote for future politics in America, the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, which just passed, of course, uh, the success in the popular media of films like Lincoln and Django Unchained, whether you like them or not. I kind of like the first one, but I uh, have some questions about the second one. Um, but all those things and others have really set the table, in my view, for truly meaningful conversations now among people uh, all sorts of people with varying views, I suspect, um, but who care the most about some of the things that really matter the most in our national life right now. And I would add, perhaps vainly, to that list of indicators of constructive conversation, uh, the success of the film that I helped to make based on, on the book that I wrote, Slavery by Another Name, which premiered almost exactly a year ago, last week, at the Sundance Film Festival and then received a huge audience, a shockingly large audience, uh, when it uh, was broadcast on PBS uh, last February. There were almost five million people tuned in to watch that film uh, the first week that it aired, uh, and it will broadcast again nationally uh, on February the 22nd. Um, uh, you can also watch it anytime at pbs.org, and there's no cost to see it, and there's no cost to, uh, uh, to screen it uh, to any group you might ever want to take it to. Um, or for yourself. Your tax dollars and your gifts to public television have already paid, well, you've already purchased it. Um, but um, it, before we get into the later conversation that will involve all of you, which really is my favorite part of the evening, though I do tend to take up most of the evening, I'm going to try hard not to do that um, tonight, but, um, but let me talk for a few minutes about not just the contents of the book, but what I call the persistent past. Uh, the past and how it insists on not being completely forgotten. And in addition to that, a subtitle that I like, and that is The Persistent Past, Reckoning with Our Racial History in the Era of Obama. So what does that mean? What am I talking about? Uh, what I mean is the question of what does a long and twisted history of racial discrimination and injury in our country mean at the dawn of a new time, a new century still, when an African-American holds our highest office, an African-American is our chief law enforcement officer, two African-Americans have served as secretaries of state in the past decade, African-Americans have held the highest positions in our military and judiciary, and at one point in the last election cycle, if you remember, the leading candidates to win the nominations of the Democratic and Republican parties for president <laughs> were both African-American at one point. It was only for, only for about a week that, um, uh, <laughs> that Herman Cain was uh, at the high, top of the polls. But, um, uh, but it, it, that moment came. Um, uh, at the same time, we're at a moment in our history when an astonishing, 
currently large and growing population of young people has no memory and little and perhaps no direct experience with the kind of racism and discrimination that once fundamentally defined American life and what it meant to be an American. Just a little more than four years ago, I made my way to Washington, D.C. Uh, to prepare for my role in covering the first inauguration of President Obama for the Wall Street Journal, where I worked for many, many years and had become senior national correspondent. On the day of the ceremony, which in fact was much colder than it is here today, I will say, uh, but on the day of the ceremony four years ago, I was fortunate enough to be on the steps of the Capitol, near the base of the podium where the president uh, took the ceremony, just a few feet away, really, from him, though beneath it lower, uh, in, a, in a small area along with Oprah Winfrey, Denzel Washington, Caroline Kennedy, Jesse Jackson, uh, and, a, and several hundred other very fortunate people. I had snuck in. I wasn't supposed to be there, but, uh, but it was a great vantage point. And behind us were 1.8 million Americans. In the paper the next day, I described the crowd as, quote, an undulating, glittering, flag-waving human blanket probably the most purple phrase of my career as a writer, um, uh, but it was quite a day. Uh, on the Sunday night before the ceremony, I attended an event organized by Martin Luther King III, who was a good acquaintance of mine uh, in Atlanta. And the event was attended by nearly all of the living legends of the Civil Rights Movement. Ambassador Andrew Young, who of all the heroes of the movement still alive, knew Dr. King the very best, was closest to him, uh, Congressman John Lewis, who of course was beaten nearly to death during the march on Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama in 1965, and who when he was the same age as some of the younger members of the crowd tonight, uh, was already emerging as a towering figure in the Civil Rights Movement. And I, I would urge young people to, to remember just how young John Lewis was when he radically changed the world. Um, and, uh, and also there that night, I believe, was Julian Bond, who was one of the founders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and who I happened to see last night at a ceremony honoring him uh, in Virginia. But all of these luminaries and many others were there that night. And I walked over to Andrew Young, who I also know fairly well, and whose office in Atlanta at that time was in the same building that I worked in. And I crouched down beside Andy and I asked him uh, how it felt for him that night. And we talked about how the event, in many ways, um, it felt something like the standard civil rights banquet uh, that we'd both attended 100 times in 100 different places. There was a gospel choir opening, an annual award to be handed out, uh, an old lion of the civil rights movement preaching about how the struggle still wasn't over, tough piece of chicken on a hotel plate, uh, a bit of a hollow sensation to, uh, to those aspects. But then we stopped and we talked about how the program looked the same, but that the substance was so radically different and how everyone in the room knew it. A black president was about to be inaugurated. An event, and we talked about this, an event unlike almost, an, an event unlike, unlike almost every living American a year or two earlier could have imagined. Unlike every other American who couldn't imagine this event, this was something that Dr. King probably could have imagined an event he could and should have witnessed. He would only be 84 years old today had he not been killed. An event that he would have agreed was a version of the mountaintop he preached about on the night before his assassination. Everyone in the room that night could feel some sense of that sensation, could feel the exhilarating sense of having arrived at the top of this highest, desperately sought for peak, and not just by that meaning the election of a black president, but all that that, all that, that represented in that moment uh, and yet there was also this other feeling in the room, and one that anyone who has ever climbed a rock face or a tall hill or finished a grueling hike uh, knows as well, and that is that having arrived at this magnificent place, difficult, magnificent place, where will we go now? What is the peak to aspire toward next? What do we do for those who couldn't make the climb? How, who will go back down in the valley to get them? How will they do it without losing their way or slipping on the rocks? The way down is often as tricky as the journey up. Those are really the questions that I think compel uh, much of our time and the national discourse that we should be in. In this extraordinary new moment, when so much has been accomplished, what do we do with the parts that haven't been accomplished? What do we do with the part? How do we even identify the things that have been accomplished? How do we 
sort out what still must be done and who has the duty to do it. And at the center of all of that is this question of what do we do about the past? Do we continue to discuss the discrimination and the injuries of the past, uh, the, the bulk of which, the obvious elements of which are no longer happening, not in the way that they were long ago, and certainly not on the scale that they were in another time, but do we keep talking about the, that troubled past, or do we stop? Do we just stop talking about it? Let a new generation rise unburdened by that pain, not carry the scars caused by the errors and the evils of an earlier generation, an earlier time. What do we do with the terrible dilemma of the past? How much energy should I ask of you all to invest in a history like the one that I offer up in my book and in my film? Now, I'm guessing that uh, my answer to that question is fairly predictable to you. Um, uh, and that would be that I would say you should spend a lot of time invested in my book and film. Uh, <laughs> but I doubt that the facts of my book and film are as obvious to all of you as that, uh, as that may be. So why don't I take a few minutes now uh, to talk about what those facts are? Because I will tell you that in the time since I became an author, uh, I have had to come to terms with something that I now realize every author since Moses has had to reckon with, and that is that not all of you have quite yet finished reading my book. Uh, <laughs> uh, but so, <laughs> Slavery by Another Name tells the story of how what I call a system of neo-slavery was resurrected after the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 and the 15th Amendment of 1865 that were supposed to have ended slavery, and legally did, in a sense, and how involuntary servitude returned with shocking force and brutality to circumscribe the lives of millions of African Americans in the rural Deep South far into the 20th century. My central character is an obscure but completely real person, a black man named Green Cottenham, who was arrested on a fictitious charge of vagrancy on a cold morning in Shelby County, Alabama, in March of 1908. Five months later, on August the 15th, Green's body was placed in a crude pine box and buried by convicts outside a forced labor coal mine near Birmingham, Alabama. He was one of hundreds of thousands of black men in the South forced into a new kind of involuntary servitude between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of World War II through perverse abuses of the judicial system abuses that were explicitly designed and endorsed by most Americans as a new way to supply labor to new industry and farming and to intimidate African Americans away from their legal and political rights. The date of his death marked a cynical convergence of the very worst aspects of really all white Americans in all regions of our country. And that's an important thing to emphasize when we're far away from the deep south as we are tonight. Um, and I talk about these things in lots of places around the country, uh, and, uh, and there, are re there are really interesting variations uh, uh, in, in the responses that I get, uh, even among people who consider it, these things to be important and want to know about it. But there's still, uh, there's still great variation in the way that people react to these things, and some of that has to do with where they are and whether they grew up around black people or whether they've really known any black people or whether they perceive these as being these issues as having been a history uh, that happened down in the South and that was done by racist uh, white people like my ancestors. Um, uh, but the truth is, the really hard, maybe the most uncomfortable uh, aspect of this story beyond just the rank violence um, and banality of what was done uh, is that the truth is that at the beginning of the 20th century, 1900, 1905, 1910, uh, there essentially were no white people anywhere in America in any meaningful numbers who really believed that black people should have authentic citizenship. Uh, it just didn't exist. Uh, white people of America, including the people who had sacrificed so much in the Civil War uh, to hold the Union together and bring an end, uh, and bring an end to slavery, even among those, uh, those people, there was, there was a consensus that slavery had been a bad thing and that involuntary servitude should stop and that black people shouldn't be brutalized uh, but there was not a widespread view among white Americans that the black people should be true citizens. And the idea that they should truly have the vote and truly participate in American life, uh, that, those were ideas that only the tiniest number of white people anywhere in America really held fast to. Uh, and, and that perhaps is one of the most uncomfortable things uh, for people to reckon with. Um, but so, 
the, uh, that, that, that date, that convergence of these terrible trends um, was happening all over America. Indeed, on the same day that Green Cottenham died in Alabama, thousands of white people in Springfield, Illinois, the hometown of our most heroic and transforming president, Abraham Lincoln, major stop on the Underground Railroad, the city that had the largest black population anywhere in the Midwest in 1908. Thousands of white people rose up August 15, 1908 in an effort to force the entire black population of the city out of Springfield, Illinois. Almost all of the predominantly black residential areas of Springfield were burned. Black-owned businesses were looted. Dozens of men were shot or beaten. Two African Americans were lynched including one infirmed old man who had once made shoes for Abraham Lincoln himself, but who in the 50 subsequent years had the temerity to become prosperous, to buy property and to take as his wife a white woman who bore and gave birth to multiracial children like Barack Obama. The, the mob, when they reached his house, because he was the wealthiest black man in Springfield, uh, they broke down the front door of the house, seeking him. Wife denied that he was there. They charged in, found him, dragged him. He was an old man. Dragged him out in the front yard, slit his neck um, in front of his family, and then hung him from a tree where he died, hanging in the tree. Uh, and then after he died, they cut the body down, and the, the tree was cut into tiny pieces of wood and then distributed as souvenirs to the mob. And there's still some folks in Springfield, Illinois, who know that back in the closet somewhere, there's somebody who they still have one of those souvenir pieces. But those were events that Springfield, Illinois, aside from a very few people who knew something about that little souvenir you know, in the cigar box somewhere, those were events that in Springfield and so many other places, because those sorts of things happen all over the place, uh, in almost every part of America at one point in time or another, but particularly in the Midwest and, and parts of the, the Northeast. But those events, uh, were ones that in Illinois, like so many other places, uh, America tried to forget in the succeeding decades. And indeed, by the time that Barack Obama arrived in Springfield as a state legislator, those memories had all but vanished of what had happened in Springfield. Almost no living person in Springfield remembered anymore that any of that had happened. So Mr. Obama had no idea, I'm almost certain, when he announced his candidacy for the White House on the steps of the old Illinois State Capitol in 2007, that he did so directly across the street from the place where the mob first organized uh, 99 years earlier and began his rampage. In 1908, more than 40 years after the ostensible end of slavery, a new national white consensus had coalesced against African Americans. The general white public, the national leadership of the Republican Party, Democrats had long before embraced these ideas, uh, and the federal government on every level were arriving at the conclusion that African Americans did not merit citizenship and that their freedom was not valuable enough to justify the conflicts that they engendered among whites. Whites across the nation concluded that blacks were essentially not worth the cost of imposing a racial morality that few in any region genuinely shared. That's the essence of slavery by another name. And it's a story that, for the most part, few living Americans have known. Indeed, we've only just now begun to fully understand some of these contours and the width and the breadth and banality of all that was done to harm African Americans in ways that still vividly shape the world that we live in and the lives of people, because we're talking about events that continued to the beginning of World War II. We're talking about these are things that happen to people who are still alive. You know, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of, uh, of African Americans who were born on a sharecrop farm or some other place in South Alabama or South Georgia. Dr. King was born in the 1920s. He was, born, he was, he was a city boy, but if he had been born in the country like his father, uh, then he would have been born in a place that was at least shaped and drawn by these events and these practices. Uh, and so these are events that directly impacted people who are still alive today and even beyond that, certainly shaped the world that we live in and the disparities that persist. If you'll indulge me for a second, let me just read a few paragraphs from the introduction of, of the book. On March 30th, 1908, Green Cottenham was arrested by the sheriff of Shelby County, Alabama, and charged with the crime of vagrancy. Cottenham had committed no true crime. Vagrancy, 
the offense of a person not being able to prove at a given moment that he or she is employed was a new and flimsy concoction dredged up from legal obscurity at the end of the 19th century by the state legislatures of Alabama and other southern states. It was capriciously enforced by local sheriffs and constables, adjudicated by mayors and notaries public, recorded haphazardly or not at all in court records, and most tellingly, in a time of massive unemployment among all Southern men, was reserved almost exclusively for black men. His offense, his true offense, was blackness. After three days behind bars, 22-year-old Cottenham was found guilty in a swift appearance before the county judge and immediately sentenced to a 30-day term of hard labor. Unable to pay the array of fees assessed on every prisoner, fees to the sheriff, the deputy, the court clerk, the witnesses who testified against him, his sentence was extended to nearly a year. The next day, Cottenham, the youngest of nine children born to former slaves, was sold. Under a standing arrangement between the county and a vast subsidiary of the industrial titan of the North, U.S. Steel Corporation, the sheriff turned the young black man over to the company for the duration of his sentence. In return, the subsidiary, Tennessee Coal, Iron, and Railroad Company, gave the county $12 a month. What the company's managers did with Cottenham and thousands of other black men they acquired from sheriffs across Alabama was entirely up to them. A few hours later, the company plunged Cottenham into the darkness of a mine called Slope No. 12, one shaft in a vast subterranean labyrinth on the edge of Birmingham known as the Pratt Mines. There he was chained inside a long wooden barrack at night and required to spend nearly every waking hour digging and loading coal. His required daily task was to remove eight tons of coal from the mine. Cottenham was subject to the whip for failure to dig the requisite amount, at risk of physical torture for disobedience, and vulnerable to the predations of other miners, many of whom already had passed years or decades in their own Chthonian confinement. The lightless catacombs of black rock, packed with hundreds of desperate men, slick with sweat and coated in pulverized coal, must have exceeded any vision of hell. A boy born in the countryside of Alabama, even a child of slaves, could have ever imagined. Waves of disease ripped through the population. In the month before Cottenham arrived at the prison mine, pneumonia and tuberculosis sickened dozens. Within his first four weeks, six died. Before the year was over, almost 60 men forced into Slope 12 were dead of disease, accidents, or homicide. Most of the broken bodies, along with hundreds of others before and after, were dumped into shallow graves scattered among the refuse of the mine. Others were incinerated in nearby ovens used to blast millions of tons of coal. Forty-five years after President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation freeing American slaves, Green Cottenham and more than a thousand other black men toiled under the lash at Slope 12. Imprisoned in what was then the most advanced city of the South, guarded by whipping bosses employed by the most iconic example of the modern corporation emerging in the Gilded North, they were slaves in all but name. So this is not the version of history that most of us have been taught. In fact, most conventional historical interpretation about this period of time, though it's a terribly under-examined period of our history, uh, has, been, has been to view the events of the earliest tw early 20th century as they related to race as a series of disconnected Southern practices, dissertations, are written on peonage, sharecropping, prison labor, antebellum industrial slavery, racial violence, political intimidation, lack of schools, the rise of white supremacy, uh, things you've heard about. Each of these things have often been treated by historians as separate phenomena, to be sliced and diced and analyzed by regions and periods of time in ways that inadvertently but consistently minimize the totality of the South's regime of coercion against African Americans. They accept a kind of inevitability to the bad things done to African Americans, as if these were unavoidable outcomes of social habits and prejudices that in the end were somehow vaguely predictable and understandable. Bad things that weren't really intentional and that simply had to be waited out until our society had outgrown them. That took a lot of overlooking fact and poor vision. The total number of workers caught up in this net is, is impossible to precisely identify. 
But I have found records that speak to hundreds of thousands of individuals in county courthouses and other places all across the South that had essentially gone unexamined by most historians. Um, repeatedly, the timing and scale of these arrests and this use of the courts to provide uh, free or almost, or almost free labor to these big commercial enterprises, repeatedly the timing and scale of these surges and arrests were much more attuned to rises and dips in the need for cheap labor than any demonstrable evidence of crime. These were not criminals who were being harshly punished. I mean, there were a few, there were some. You know, when there's a murder and there's a dead body on the floor, somebody killed them. There's a murder somewhere. Uh, so there were criminals who were punished in this way, and there were some white people who uh, found themselves drawn into this system as well. But overwhelmingly, this was a fate that was reserved for black men, uh, and it happened when, when business needed more black men at very low cost. By 1900, the South's judicial system had been wholly reconfigured to make one of its primary purposes the coercion of African Americans to comply with the social customs and labor demands of whites. And the terror, the terror that this might happen was essential then to forcing African Americans away from the voting booth, away from the courts, and away from exercising their civil rights and their then willingness to abide the other kinds of exploitative labor that we know more about, like sharecropping. It also generated giant amounts of money, vast amounts of money, vast profits for the companies who were involved in it, and tremendous amounts of money for the county governments and sheriffs and state governments who facilitated it. Uh, in all the southern states eventually, there were these elaborate systems in which thousands and thousands and thousands of men were being, were being sold into involuntary servitude. And one of the side effects of that was that it recreated the old system, the old commercial systems of slavery. The old, the wholesalers and retailers and all the different roles that had existed with slavery before the Civil War. Well, that economic system resurrected itself. Uh, when you create a market, then you, you create a value for, for the product. And the product in this system uh, was a strong black man who could be forced into labor. And this new system placed a value on those men. And that value was about 50 to 100 dollars, typically. Whereas in antebellum slavery, the value of black men had been vastly more, vastly more. So valuable that, in fact, uh, the value of a, an enslaved man uh, actually served to protect uh, an enslaved person in some respects, because a person who bought a, uh, bought, bought a man or a woman didn't, didn't want to lose that investment. But in this new system, there was no real value, uh, no significant value attached to these individuals. Uh, and so they could be worked to the very edge of human capacity, and they were worked to death with such incredible frequency. The mortality rates in these, in these work camps uh, were often 30 and 40 percent a year. And so to be sent into one of the 50 or 60 forced labor camps in Georgia at the beginning of the 20th century uh, was like rolling the dice uh, for 50-50 odds of whether you would be alive a year later. It was a terrifying, terrifying thing that sapped so much talent and energy and ambition uh, and, and potential out of African American communities and damaged the larger community that existed as well. In the state of Alabama, uh, for many, many years, the revenue that was derived from these practices was the single largest source of revenue for the state of Alabama for decades. It's an astonishing fact. On July 31st, 1903, a letter to President Theodore Roosevelt arrived at the White House from a woman named Carrie Kinsey, a barely literate African American in Bainbridge, Georgia. Her 14-year-old brother, James Robinson, had been abducted a year earlier and sold to a plantation. Local police would take no interest. Mr. President, wrote Mrs. Kinsey, struggling to overcome the illiteracy of her world, they won't let me have him. He has not done nothing for them to have him in chains, so I write to you for your help. I pause for a moment and imagine this letter and the context that it was written in. Here you have, imagine yourself, I have a 15-year-old son, so imagine yourself, uh, you have a 14-year-old sibling who has been kidnapped and sold into slavery. And you know who kidnapped him. Uh, and in this, you know, he hasn't even been charged with a crime. He's just been kidnapped and sold into slavery. Because this system has become so pervasive that there's an established value in every young black man. And so you don't even have to pretend anymore uh, that they've committed a crime. You can just snatch them, sell them to the people who are in the business of, of buying people who have been convicted. 
And so this has happened to your 14-year-old sibling. And you've been to the sheriff, and you've probably been to the postmaster, who's maybe the most friendly person in, in your world, to a, to a poor black person. Uh, you've been to the store owner at the, at the, uh, the nearby country store that, where you probably trade. You've been to the people you have some level of confidence in, and nobody will take any interest in this, because this is just how things work now. It's the 20th century. This is how it works. So no one will do anything uh, to assist you and to then reach a point of desperation so great that the only thing you can think of left to do is to write a letter to the President of the United States. That's just as astonishing. When I found that letter, I just stopped cold. I just, it, it's by far the most affecting artifact of all the thousands of things that I came across and read in the course of the years that I've spent on this. But like the vast majority of such pleas, and there are 30,000 of them in the National Archives. Her letter was slipped into a small rectangular folder at the Department of Justice and tagged with a reference number, 12007. No further action was ever recorded. Her letter lies in the National Archives today. A world in which the seizure and sale of a black man, even a black child, was viewed as neither criminal nor extraordinary had re-emerged. Millions of blacks lived in that shadow as four or their family members, or African Americans simply in terror of the system's caprice. This practice would not begin to fully recede from their lives until the dawn of World War II. So that's the terrible history that, uh, that my book is about, and that the film is about. Um, perhaps I should uh, talk a little bit about why I wrote this book, why I took an interest in it. Uh, in fact, I'm certain that there's someone in the room who's already framing a question uh, that, based on past experience, goes along the lines of, why would a white guy uh, from the Mississippi Delta, uh, who worked most of the past 20 years for Rupert Murdoch um, <laughs> at the most conservative newspaper in America, write this book? Uh, and, the, and the answer to that is complicated, as you can imagine. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but all the versions of the answer to that go back to, to where I come from in one way or another, uh, and that is the Mississippi Delta, and, uh, and which you may know what that is or not, but that's the, the most fertile, flat-plained, in some respects, Nebraska-like looking landscape of the Mississippi Delta, but, uh, of, of the South. Uh, but whatever image you may have in your mind of a, of a cotton plantation, uh, it is an image of the Mississippi Delta. Um, <laughs> and uh, by far the most productive cotton, uh, cotton land probably in the world, certainly uh, in North America. Uh, and a place that um, uh, where there were more black people than white in the world that I grew up in. Um, and, uh, and a twisted and difficult uh, uh, set of circumstances that surrounded the lives of both uh, black people and white in that place. I was not a part, uh, my family was not a planter family. My, my dad worked for the government. But I was a child of the Mississippi Delta and a descendant of Southerners who uh, never owned slaves, as far as I know, and that actually is not something that really matters, but, uh, but who fought for the Confederacy as privates and grunts and such uh, in uh, largely unrecorded ways, and then passed generations on obscure farms in North Carolina and Alabama, Arkansas, and finally ended up in Louisiana, and then I ended up back in Mississippi. But I was born in the Delta in the fall of 1964, when the South was convulsing through the, uh, the darkest hours of the Civil Rights Movement. Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney had been murdered by the Klan not all that far away a few months earlier. Within a year after I was born, a group of black farm workers, many of whom still lived in desperate 19th century conditions uh, uh, in 1964 and 65, no power, no running water. Uh, this is hard to believe, and I used to not believe it myself, but I have, have come to accept that it is true. Um, there were African Americans on plantations, big, vast plantations in the Delta in 1964 and 65, who when civil rights workers first visited there, um, uh, told the civil rights folks that they had never seen U.S. currency. I, I used to not believe that, but, uh, but now I, I think that I do. But this group of folks went on strike in 1965. Uh, they were evicted from their homes on the plantation. They set up a tent encampment first, and then they built little houses out, out in the country. They were attacked by the Ku Klux Klan. The men were never allowed to work in the county again for their entire lives. Uh, the place came to be known as Strike City, and it was briefly at the center of media attention around the Civil Rights Movement, and then it was largely forgotten. Most of the strikers died over the years, though there's still two strikers alive who are still out at Strike City, <laughs> amazingly, amazingly. 
But that was in 1965. Uh, and it, it turned out that I went to school. I didn't know it for a long time, but I went to school with some of the children of Strike City. But in 1969, a group of black students who were protesting that the, high, that the schools in our town were still completely segregated uh, 15 years after the Brown decision. So a group of black students uh, staged a very peaceful march from the black high school, Abraham Lincoln High, uh, to, the, to the white high school. And as they arrived at the white campus singing a song uh, peacefully, they were tear gassed by the redneck police chief uh, of the town. And a melee ensued, and there were fights that broke out, and windows were broken. And at one point, a 16-year-old African-American boy burst through the front door of a feed and seed store uh, not too far away, and the white man behind the counter pulled a pistol out, shot him in the door. Uh, the, the, the young man survived, but there was never an investigation. There was no, no one was ever charged. Finally, um, after a Supreme Court ruling in, uh, later in 1969 that, that forced the immediate desegregation of, of my town schools and 29 other districts in Mississippi and ultimately pretty much every school system in the South, uh, the schools were finally fully integrated in 1970, and I began the first grade in the fall of 1970. Um, and so I was in the first class of children in Mississippi to begin the first day of first grade, black and white together, and go through 12 grades of public education uh, with black kids and white kids in the same classroom. Now, of course, I was a child. I didn't know about any of that uh, when it was happening. Uh, had no awareness whatsoever of, of any of the things that I've just told you, except that I did know something was up. You know, so something really, really big was up, uh, uh, and, uh, and nobody would explain what it was. Um, and, uh, the, uh, and in particular, I was aware that all the African-American kids were mad at me uh, for some reason, and I couldn't pinpoint what it was. Uh, and, uh, and so all the white kids were mad back at them, even though we couldn't really say, figure out what, what exactly we were mad about either. But the, uh, it also uh, occurred to me that uh, I was one of the small group of white families uh, who were going to the public schools. And so also all these other white kids, the majority of the white kids that I knew at church and everywhere else, um, uh, they were mad at me too. For some reason I couldn't put my finger on. You know, so I was just kind of mad back at them. Um, and uh, so we had this very tense, uh, complicated world uh, in which I went to school, went to a school that had far more black people in it than white. Uh, and I really knew more black people than I did white people as a child. Uh, but every other aspect of my life uh, remained archly segregated. Uh, little League Baseball, the swimming pool owned by the city uh, was still segregated. Church that I went to was, uh, was all white. Uh, every aspect of life uh, remained completely segregated except this experience in public school. Uh, and at a pretty early age, I was trying to understand why that was. What, what was that all about? Why did my family live, even though we were not, we were a very modest, modest uh, family, uh, but why did we live so differently nonetheless than all these black families who lived right around the corner from us? You know, why were there all these terrible things that all these black folks had to deal with, including the kids I was mad at, um, uh, uh, that I clearly was not going to have to deal with. Uh, why were things the way that they were? Um, why was there all this anger that was there as well? And so I started asking questions about this for whatever reason. I don't know why I was compelled by all this, but I was. My brothers were not. I mean, most of the kids I knew were not. But I began to ask a lot of questions about why are things the way they are. And those were not welcome questions at all <laughs> coming from a... Uh, from a young boy. And in the, uh, in the seventh grade, I, uh, there was an essay contest sponsored by the County Historical Society. It was the sesquicentennial of Washington County. And so the uh, Historical Society, which of course is a bunch of little old white ladies, um, uh, uh, organized this essay contest and any student at any school in the county could submit an essay on any topic related to the history of the county, w w wide open. And so for some reason, uh, I wrote an essay, a short little seventh grader's essay, about Strike City, about that farm labor strike um, uh, in 1965. Now to this day, I don't know how I even knew that that event had occurred because uh, it was 10 years past by then uh, and no white person would have ever spoken of it, uh, it certainly not to a child. Um, but somehow I knew about it and I got interested in that and I wrote this little simple little essay about it. Uh, and uh, submitted it for the contest. And uh, a few weeks later, a letter arrived in the mail with my name on it. Amazing event in the 1970s for a child. Uh, open up the letter, I read it. I had won second place, third place, something like that in the, uh, uh, in the essay contest. And I was to go to the county fair on a particular day, particular place, and Mrs. Baker, the writer, the author of the letter, and meet Mrs. Baker there. And she would escort me to the award ceremony. And she was gonna be wearing a blue dress. The letter told me that. 
And, um, and so when the appointed day came, my mother dropped me off at the county fair, something none of, well, uh, maybe in Nebraska you can't, still can, but some, something I wouldn't do with my 12-year-old today. Um, but uh, I was dropped off at the county fair. I made my way to the place. Uh, and there was Mrs. Baker. It was obviously her, this middle-aged white lady in blue dress, um, standing around looking for people. And, uh, but I was too timid, suddenly, to walk up and introduce myself. I was afraid that she would not be Mrs. Baker and I would be embarrassed. And so I stood there for a long time waiting for her to notice me. Uh, and she looked at me several times, no hint of recognition, so I thought it must not be Mrs. Baker. Finally, another little white boy comes walking along who I knew through church circles, uh, and they immediately recognized each other. He went to one of, the, one of the SEG academies, these private schools that popped up overnight to try to preserve uh, segregated white schools. And he went to one of those, but I knew him from church. And they immediately began talking about the essay contest. And I realized, ah, that is Mrs. Baker. And so I walk up finally, bravely now, and introduce myself. And I don't know if I realized it in the instant that she looked into my eyes or if I figured it out later, uh, but it dawned on me uh, that by virtue of the topic of my essay, the fact that I attended an overwhelmingly black school, the oddity of my last name, uh, I was supposed to have been the little black boy getting a certificate that day. <laughs> Uh, so, so I have always uh, considered myself an early beneficiary of affirmative action. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so the next year, uh, the town oratorical contest came around, and I, uh, I decided to do a, give a speech in the town oratorical contest based on my, my award-winning essay of the previous year. Uh, and so, uh, and the Lions Club sponsored this uh, this speech contest every year. And uh, I won the uh, junior high school uh, part of the competition. And the finals were uh, for the two finalists from the high school and the one from the junior high school to give our speeches to a meeting of the, of the Lions Club and the winner would be selected. And uh, so the day came and uh, the three of us went to give our speeches and the two high school both gave the kinds of uplifting speeches about new generation for the future that a high school kid is supposed to give. Um, and, uh, and then I got up and gave my speech about Strike City. Um, now, in my mind, uh, my eighth grade mind, um, these events, uh, e even though they were only 10 or 12 years past at that point, but they were ancient history in my mind. Um, and in fact, even though I had gone out and interviewed the plantation owner in the course of writing the essay at one point, and I talked to a couple of other living people who had been related to those events, um, in my mind, they were all dead even though I had talked to some of them. Uh, this was just ancient, dead history that no one could possibly uh, still have any concerns about. It was a curiosity, not something of any power. Uh, and, I, and so I got up and I gave my speech and I told the story of the strikers and the Ku Klux Klansmen attacking them and then it ended triumphantly with uh, how the Civil Rights Movement came along and they were liberated from these conditions and, uh, and everything worked out well. Now, as soon as I started giving the speech, though, I realized that something, again, was up. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, because in the really serious parts of the speech, uh, the men in the room, uh, these 45 you know, white guys, middle-aged white guys, they would kind of snicker in these places that, you, you know, that, were, that weren't funny. Um, and then in the uplifting, serious parts, they were just dead silent. Um, uh, and so, uh, it, of course, it had not ever crossed my mind uh, that I might be giving my speech to the Ku Klux Klansmen who had attacked <laughs> the civil rights workers. Um, but in fact, that's exactly what, uh, what I was doing. Um, and, uh, and so uh, uh, I did not win, as you might imagine. <laughs> so, uh, but afterwards, uh, we all lined up for the handshake line, you know, uh, afterwards the three of us and all the men filed by shaking our hands, telling us we did a good job. And, uh, but there was this one fellow who hung back the whole time uh, and I sort of noticed him out of the corner of my eye, but uh, all adults were mysterious to me at that point, and uh, so I didn't know what he was up to. And then finally he waited until all the others had gone by, and then he, he rushed up and lit into me. You know, where did you get all that stuff, boy? You know, who told you all that? Nothing like that happened. You know, did your mom and daddy tell you those things? And he got more and more vociferous and you know, gesticulating around and bumping into me. Uh, and the way that I remember him, he was about eight feet tall, and he had a shock of white hair, and he was about 90 years old, and uh, I strongly suspect he looked very similar to how I look uh, right now in reality. Uh, but finally, at some point, my teacher, my, my advisor, uh, wedged herself between the two of us and said something to the guy, and 
and he spun around and took off out the, out the door. And again, I was just, you know, wow, what was that about? You know, it I, I made no sense to me whatsoever. But then a few days later, another letter comes in the mail, you know, the mystery letter. This time it's from the president of the Lions Club, uh, and it's this elaborate apology uh, about the incident that had occurred, and et cetera, et cetera. And I, you know, I read the letter, and I, again, I just I was completely mystified. I had no idea, really, what, what any of this was all about, just more mysterious adult behavior. Um, but I did notice a year later uh, when the Lions Club never again sponsored the town oratorical contest. Uh, that was the end of the Leland, Mississippi Lions, <laughs> Lions Club oratorical contest. Um, many years later, uh, I decided to go back to the town uh, and write, uh, take some assessment. My family was long gone. Uh, uh, by then, by the 1990s, and, uh, and I had sort of become disconnected from the place because once I, once I was out of high school, I really never went back in a meaningful way. And uh, but I, so I decided to go back um, uh, about 20 years after those events and uh, take the measure of what had happened and you know, what had really been accomplished by this. Because by then I had learned, I had figured out that I was in this inaugural class of blacks and whites who started school together and went all the way through. Uh, something I had not known until I was in college, but I'd figured that out, and I decided to go back and, uh, and assess what it had all added up to. And um, uh, a lot of which surprised me, and I, but I ended up writing a long essay about that essentially those events that I've just told you, most of them, uh, and uh, many of which I had not known about before. And that was published in Harper's Magazine in 1992. In fact, the book that I'm writing now is sort of an elaboration on all of that. Hope to make a film uh, related to it as well. But, the, but after that essay was published in Harper's, uh, the folks in my hometown obviously were not all that thrilled about it, uh, some of them, uh, and, the, and the man who had been the mayor of the town through almost all of my childhood uh, wrote a letter to the editor in which he said that no one in my hometown could remember any of the events described in, in the essay that I had just published. Not a single thing, not one single event could anyone remember. So it was a lesson to me a lot of things have been lessons to me about how hard we work to not remember things. Because he was probably telling the truth when he said that he couldn't remember any of it, nobody else could remember any of it. There was a version of that that was true to him. He couldn't remember any of it because it was all so inconsequential to him in reality. Uh, and so it just sort of faded away, uh, and he couldn't remember a bit of it. But as Americans, we've been trained to work at forgetting a lot of things. Uh, and what I say to you tonight and, and, uh, and what I hope my book helps to do in a very authoritative and scholarly way is to just stand against that unapologetically. It's a challenge to the idea that, that these, to anyone who would minimize this history or deny the history that I was talking about earlier, and I reject the idea that we can pretend that those events are so distant and so remote that they really don't matter. When the reality is that if we're at all sincere about the things that, that, that something that almost all of us, I think, generally agree on, we all generally agree, uh, almost everybody in America agrees on some version of this idea of, that our, of where our country ought to be going and the better place we want it to be and the, this place that, uh, that regardless of what you think about whether there's opportunity now, we all agree that there should be equal equal chances for people in the future, and we're going to be happier if more people have more success, uh, and we don't want there to be unnecessary obstacles in the path of, of any Americans. We all agree on some version of that vision, but if we're sincere about that, if we're sincere about trying to get our country to that place, then we also have to be able to be honest about why things are the way they are now. And the history that I've been talking about tonight is inextricably necessary to understanding the disparities that still exist between the economic achievements and educational attainment of African Americans and white Americans and other groups. Uh, if you want to understand why things really are the way they are, unless you know, you're a white supremacist, I mean, you know, unless your explanation is that white people are just smarter, you know, and then end of story, well, then you're, you're, you're set if that's what you think, you know, that's your explanation. But if that's not what you think, then there's got to be some other explanation. Uh, and it's not that black people haven't worked hard enough uh, or that, uh, that, that they don't have aspirations. Uh, it's, not, it's not any of those things. Uh, and so when you've been in that conversation with someone, as all of us have been in, where somebody, maybe we ourselves, have said, 
why do black people have to keep talking about slavery? You know, when are they going to stop? You know, when is Jesse Jackson going to stop complaining about all this stuff? Stop talking about slavery. Well, the reality is that, and then when someone says slavery ended 150 years ago, well, no, it didn't. No, it didn't. Uh, the, the reality of slavery, the reality of involuntary servitude and the damage that it did in terms of economic terms and the restraint of people to exercise their liberty and to, and to leverage the, the, the mechanisms of opportunity in America, the reality is that the widespread ability of African Americans to tap into the ways that white people and families like mine rose out of poverty between the 1910s and the 1950s uh, those mechanisms were not available to the vast majority of black people in America until about 1970. You know, 1970, you know, a solid 100 years after the end of slavery. And slavery itself, real live slavery, buying and selling people slavery, didn't really stop until the 1940s, stop in a significant way until the 1940s. And so if we're honest with ourselves and we're honest about where we want our country to go and figuring out a way there, uh, if, we want, if we're honest about how to find the next peak and the route there, if we're honest about that, sincere about it, uh, then we're going to be able <clears throat> to come to terms with these are things that we have to understand and we have to be willing to reset the clock on our comprehension of these events. So I'm going to stop with one last thing. Uh, not long after the, my book was first published, uh, I got an email from someone I've never met, um, but who was a descendant of a man in uh, Atlanta named Joel Hurt, who was one of the great pioneers of uh, creating modern Atlanta. Very, very wealthy family, still very wealthy. And by the way, none of these things, just uh, what, say very quickly, nobody's responsible for what the grandfather did or the great-grandfather did. You know, nobody carries any burden, and I don't, I don't suggest uh, that any of us uh, have any moral injury from something that our ancestors did. Now, how we respond to the knowledge that things happened in the past, that may be a test of our character. Uh, but I don't suggest in any way that because somebody's family did something a long time ago that that says something about them. Uh, we, all, we all have only our own conduct to account for. But this, this woman uh, wrote me, a school teacher, actually from somewhere um, uh, in the Midwest, as I recall. But this email pops up uh, about this figure in the book who uh, had made his fortune through terrible practices uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And she wrote me, Dear Mr. Blackman, I'm the great-great-granddaughter of Joel Hurt, this man. I have only just discovered your book. I have found everything possible about it on the web, including this fascinating website. I'm trying to muster the courage to read your book. Just reading excerpts has been quite painful. Needless to say, this is a very emotional subject for us, as we did not know of any of this before. But in the meantime, I'm writing because I want to thank you for having written it. I have had that same photo of great-great-grandfather hanging on my wall for years and have always been proud of his participation in rebuilding Atlanta after the Civil War. But I believe that the ghosts of slavery and racism and the terrorism inflicted within our own country must not be hidden away, but brought out into the open. I am so grateful to learn more of the truth of my family's past. Without the whole truth, we live only in illusions and I would hate to live my life perpetuating illusions, especially such horrific ones whose ramifications continue today. I remain proud of where I come from, but humbled by the realities you brought to light. And I thank that reader for her vote of confidence, and I thank all of you for listening to me tonight. Questions? Denunciations? Uh, <clears throat> Hi. Go ahead. I, oh. Oh. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. We'll go next. Oh, I'm. <clears throat> go ahead. Oh. Um, years ago, uh, things that you talk about, uh, things that you have written, uh, were suppressed. Um, have you ever received any backlash or? Um, I just don't want to come out and sure. say, well, threats, threats or, right? yeah, that, you know, well, I, or whatever to the things that you've written and the things that you talk about. Well, so, somewhat to my surprise, I, I get asked that fairly frequently, and um, uh, somewhat to my surprise, less than, less than one might think. Um, 
The, uh, and, and, you know, and have I ever like felt in danger? I, I don't think so. Uh, it's, it's, I've been at it for so long now, some of it I don't remember anymore. But, um, the, you know, have there been uncomfortable moments? Yes. Um, and uh, have I gotten some mean letters, you know, and a few, you know, white supremacist uh, screeds? Yes. Uh, but uh, by and large, uh, I, what I have found is that, one, these events are so forgotten at this point that people don't know to hide them anymore. That's one thing, you know. Uh, and, uh, and also, you know, younger people, uh, uh, people younger even than me, and I'm very young, um, uh, <laughs> you know, are, are just able to talk about a lot of things that, that, that lots of us would have actually been more uncomfortable talking about even 10 years ago or 15 years ago and certainly 20 years ago. Uh, even my parents, who were very, uh, for their times, you know, very moderate whites in the South, um, but who still came from this incredibly racist world and carried, you know, carried their own prejudices and had to escape that, you know, that burden, uh, and became very, very, uh, very much so on the right side of things uh, by the 60s and the 70s. Uh, but even they, you know, were things that they probably would have been uncomfortable talking about in my childhood, as they were. Um, and uh, and so people actually, you know, the the ability to talk about some of these things has actually opened up bigger and bigger. Um, I will tell you that I'm. Uh, uh, that it, it, there was an issue of trying to sort of spirit out some of this information at times, not so much because of a, 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 an overt effort to conceal it, because as I said, most of it, people didn't even know it was there anymore. Uh, so much of what is in my book comes from records and things that were, that had been abandoned, you know, things that I found in, in uh, you know, the county junk building somewhere where they had emptied out the the county probate office 20 years ago, and nobody even knew what was there anymore. And then I would go there and spend weeks and weeks reassembling these old court records from the early part of the 20th century and that sort of thing. But I, I, uh, one of the things I discovered was that in the state of Alabama, where I went to many, many, many courthouses, uh, because the epicenter of all this was in Alabama and Georgia, though it happened everywhere in the South uh, on a large scale. And I went to so many courthouses in Alabama looking for these records, and I would arrive at the uh, at, at each of these courthouses, and uh, usually wearing a suit, looking like this, um, and I would go up to the county, the the, the court clerk's desk. Uh, the the titles change a little bit from one state to the next, um, and start asking about old criminal court records. One of the things that I quickly learned was that the same middle-aged white lady is the court clerk at every courthouse in Alabama. <laughs> same woman, she's there. She would always arrive just before I got there and have just sat down. I realized um, uh, when I walked in. And, uh, and I would start asking about these old, uh, these old records, and immediately she would always say, oh, the courthouse burned down a long time ago, and all that got burned with it. You know? And so uh, I started noticing on the cornerstones of the buildings as I would come in what year the buildings have been built. And so she would tell me that the building had burned down, and I'd say, well, the cornerstone says this building got burned down and you know, it got built in 1920 or 1910. Um, uh, when did it burn down? You know, or is this the courthouse that burned down? Or was the old courthouse that burned down? And all it took was a little bit of, just a little objection to throw off the script. Um, and then she would say, oh, that's what you're talking about. Uh, but, but still, almost always, she would say, but, oh, but actually, we don't have any of that. You know, it's not, none of it's left anymore. When we got computers, you know, that all got thrown away. But then I would say, this is my trick question, and this sounds like I'm making it up, but I, I, I swear to you, it's, this is the truth. I would then say, and this, happened, this worked many times, I would say, oh, but don't you remember? Of course, that's the signal that I'm actually from there. Uh, um, and so now she has to change posture slightly. Don't you remember um, several years ago when the, uh, uh, when, the, when the high school coach brought the seniors over to do their project and they cleaned out that room in the basement of the courthouse and they took all those big leather-bound books out and she would stop <laughs> and look at me and say, Oh, <laughs> so, but it wasn't the high school football team, it was the county convicts, or it was you know, the Lions Club, or whatever, you know, but, but uh, it would trip, oh, and I'd say, oh, really, well, where did they take that stuff? Oh, it's in the old county health department building. Oh, well, who's got the key? Uh, oh, well. And then, and then there I would find it. So, but surprisingly, I did not, you know, nobody ever came and knocked on the door in the night and told me I had to stop this or I'd be killed, you know, but, but um, uh, so, it, it, so it's a more optimistic response than I, even I once imagined. Uh, how has the uh, book changed you? And then secondly, you made such an eloquent case on the economic impact of the uh, slavery and, and, and the aftermath. What's your stand on reparation? 
Well, in the first of those, the, uh, uh, it's hard to say how, it's, you know, how it has affected me, but certainly all of this that I've told you about um, uh, uh, obviously you know, has shaped me. Um, I, was, um, uh, I was a bit stunned as I began uh, penetrating the work after the original, because I originally wrote a story that appeared in the Wall Street Journal, uh, where I worked at the time, long, elaborate piece. That, uh, but it was much narrower in scope, and then there was a big response uh, to that story, which I write about in the introduction of the book. Uh, and then I was sort of sought after to write a book, which I really didn't want to do, because I, I had been said to the publisher that ultimately published the book, when he called and said, you should write a book about this, I said, I, you know, I don't want to, uh, and you know, it's, it's too depressing, and you know, I just don't, I don't you know, I've, I've sort of said it, I've said, and uh, I've got to move on to other things. But I eventually, uh, I did, and uh, it was supposed to take two years, and 10 years later the book came out. But, um, but the, uh, as I began to work on it uh, and began to realize that, that this was really not, this wasn't a story about a bad thing that happened in Alabama you know, back in some limited period of time, that this was actually about this big, you know, this big system that had manifested itself and that had such broader implications. Um, that's really when I, that, that's what then fueled me to really write the book. Uh, but there was a point in there where, and this may sound funny for me to say, but you got to remember that I grew up in a black town in a black county and knew more black people than I did white when I was a child. And so I always was, considered myself to be the white guy who got black people. That's who I always thought I was. And I knew the history and I was interested in civil rights and, uh, and, uh, and so I kind of thought I knew everything. You know, I really thought I knew everything. Um, and then when, uh, when I began to probe deeper into these things and really began to come across some of the passages you would see in the book, uh, just these, these ghoulishly terrible things that happened, and that they happened over and over and over and over again, and the, the destruction of it, and then people resisting this, you know, really violently resisting all of this, but then being, you know, just these forces so powerful against them. Uh, I really, I had a, you know, a deep sense of shame, even though I didn't have, you know, I didn't do any of that, you know, and as far as I know, not even any of my people did, you know, I, you know uh, but, but I had a profound sense of shame that, uh, uh, that, that I can't really um, uh, around that. But then, uh, what was the second question? I'm sorry. Reparations. Reparations, yes. Well, in the, I'll confess to you that in the epilogue of the book, I specifically say the book is neither an argument for reparations or against them. Um, and, uh, and that's a, there's long, uh, um, I, give, I have a lot of thoughts about reparations, um, but the, what it boils down to is that I think that the, the, the simplest version of slavery reparations has been talked about, you know, some sort of a, you know, adding it up and cutting a check to whatever it would be, all African Americans or, you know, some group of, of uh, descendants of the victims of slavery. I think ultimately there, there's, there's probably kind of a moral argument for that, but I think that practically speaking, it's, prob it's not possible and would probably trigger difficulties that, you know, other things that, that would not be good. But, the, but I do think that there is a burden on our society, and, I, and it's not just on the descendants of white people. It's just a burden on our society collectively to repair the damage that was done. And that's a duty that we owe to everybody. We, do, we owe that to the victims of Hurricane Sandy and the victims of Hurricane Katrina. You know, but you know when, when, we, when terrible things happen that we know happened, and particularly when we know we did it as a country, you know, none of us did it, but our country, our society did it, uh, we've got a duty to try to repair some of those things. And in the last 40 years, in the last 50 years, since 1970, we have had tremendous success at repairing a lot of things. You know, the, the economic achievements and educational achievements of African Americans since 1970, mathematically, empirically, with all of the negatives that still exist, the achievements of African Americans that period of time are greater than that of any ethnically identifiable group of people in human history. That's a fact. That is a mathematical fact. If you're honest about where things actually stood in 1969 and where they've come to, it's astonishing. And that's what happens when you liberate a group of ambitious, talented, hardworking, desperate to get their shot people. You know, then, then those things happen when you give them actual opportunity. And what else happens? The larger society benefits tremendously. You know, th and, that's, and that's exactly what's happened. And things like affirmative action, reasonable kinds of affirmative action, were instrumental to elements of that. And government involvement in, in creating the, path, the, the possibility of those things to happen was instrumental. And it is madness 
for us to be abandoning all of those things in the kind of thoughtless, wholesale, crude, clumsy ways that we have abandoned them in the past decade. The uh, I know it, it's like post your pre your book is post this, but the book and then the movie The Help caused quite a stir. In your research, what did you find about the life of the African American woman at this time? Oh well, I think the depiction of the you know, hey, talking about the movie The Help, uh, which uh, if you didn't hear that. Um, uh, the depiction of the kind of the lives of African American women uh, working as domestic laborers in the help, uh, you know, is is in a sense reasonably accurate. Um, uh, you know, this kind of put upon uh, lives that they had and, and uh, that didn't have a lot of economic uh, remuneration to it, but was the only thing they could do in in, a, in that closed society. That's fairly accurate. And the various ways in which, uh, and I, I say that with confidence because. Uh, my family didn't have any wealth, but you didn't have to have any wealth um, uh, in Mississippi to have a black maid um, in 1960, you know, uh, or 19, um, uh, up until the point that Congress passed the law that extended the minimum wage to domestic workers. That's the, that's the moment when that whole world ends. But up until that time, um, in, any white family uh, could have at least a part-time black maid, of all, a family of almost any economic standing. My parents, when they lived in married student housing at Louisiana State, had a black maid who helped uh, take care of the kids. Uh, and, the, and, when, uh, and when I was growing up, uh, you know, there was a succession of different women, but there was always a lady like that who at least once or twice a week came to our house. And in fact, the help was filmed in the t one town over from the, from the town where I grew up in Mississippi. So, uh, you know, so that depiction is all fairly accurate. The, the one thing, though, that needs to be said is this whole story of, uh, and, and this is what, and again, I don't mean to sound too far out on this sort of thing, but, the, um, uh, but, but ultimately what's kind of offensive about that film uh, is this suggestion that these African-American women sort of only get their act together and stand up for themselves when this little pretty white girl comes along and motivates them, you know? Um, and that's a nonsensical story, and nothing like that ever happened. You know, it's a complete fantasy fabrication. Uh, and it completely misrepresents uh, the reality of, uh, of how anything was working in that period of time. But the, but the idea that the daughter of one of these great families uh, um, in Jackson, Mississippi would have organized the, the black maids in that way is just a preposterous story um, and, and really an insult to, the, to those black women who lived those lives, in, in my opinion. Got a question here? In the back, sure. Uh, I have several, several concerns. Uh, the, the one is, um, that for all that your presentation um, possibly did in the hearts of those uh, that were sitting here, uh, to think of the despicableness uh, of that, and then at this moment in the aftermath, kind of to release that. Uh, I don't want to release it, because m my challenge is that it drives me to a, a new activism. Uh, and again, I I'm hoping that for, for, for many of us, is we don't consider it just a feel-good moment now uh, when earlier on we were having a, a real cathartic, real deep pain about something that was really real. Uh, I'm concerned also about uh, buildings like this where uh, racism and, and all those things uh, get put on the back burner, whether it be in sermons or uh, in feel-good moments where we say, let's bring in somebody to talk to us about it, and then in the aftermath, we do nothing, uh, join forces on and on. Uh, the last thing I want, I, I want to just reference is uh, for all the achievement, for all the empirical numbers, right. uh, what's your, your thought about uh, the American penal system where in, in no uncertain terms African American men are in, there in droves and as business and industry continue to figure out how to use that prison system for their own ends, we're back to your point again. Yeah, well, I, I'll talk first about the prison part and I'll try to give quick tight enough answers so that we can get an, uh, more questions. But the, uh, obviously I get asked about the mass incarceration all the time. Uh, and some people will, uh, will say very explicitly, well, this is mass incarceration now is, is, is the exact same thing, you know, the continuous extension of the exact same thing. And that's actually not the case, and just in terms of the pure facts of it. Um, but, the, but I do think it's true that, well, number one, I should start with, that uh, you know, I know more about the past in some respects than the, than the future, but the, and certainly the specifics of the American penal system now, and so I, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert on it, but I will say that um, anyone who doesn't recognize that the current state of affairs uh, 
however it was arrived at and however complicated it might be to change it. But anyone who doesn't realize that this is the great cancer on American society and that this is the thing, both the mass incarceration and the fact that, and this is something I know more about and have begun to do some work on, there is a demonstrably and extraordinarily high error rate in the convictions of Americans who, who are sent to prison. Uh, people convicted of very serious crimes and there's this growing body of statistical evidence that makes it really clear that, um, that it's the number somewhere like five, six, seven, eight percent of the people who are incarcerated in America, there's every reason to believe, did not commit the crimes they were convicted of. Uh, and when you multiply that against the size of the population of people who are incarcerated, you're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are in prison who did not do, did not do the deed. Uh, and that, the, the, the faultiness and flaws of our judicial system, which are profound, I'm convinced of that, uh, that and the mass incarceration in of itself, these are the things that 50 years from now, in this building or whatever building replaces it, there will be a conversation where somebody comes in and talks about these things that were happening 50 years ago, and there will be, and our grandchildren will, will sit there and say, how could they not have seen that? How could that not have been obvious to them? How, how could they have just looked at that and said, gee, that's unfortunate, but there's nothing we can do about it? I mean, this is the, that is the cancer on, on our era. And uh, I don't know the solution. I don't know, and the, but I do know that that uh, one thing is certain, and that is that when, uh, well, two things that, that speak back to what I've written about. One, uh, it is through the system that I have depicted that America became a place that got its head around, that white America and American society at large got comfortable with the idea that, oh yeah, of course, you know, most black boys are inclined to become criminals and it makes sense that most of them or a huge number of them get arrested and that they get punished or put to work in some manner. Uh, what I write about is what normalized that idea. It normalized this idea for most Americans that the criminal justice system is now the way to control this big black population uh, and where the previous way was through, through the sheriff and the, and the, and the slave master. Uh, and that's why nobody found it particularly outrageous for a really long time. And so there's that connection. The other connection is that whenever profit is an element in the administration and execution of justice, you know, the execution of justice is really the most sacred act of, of our government and our society, is whether we fairly execute justice. And when you put into the equation of justice an opportunity for anybody to make money, where it becomes the case that the more people who have justice executed a particular way, the more money somebody makes. Whenever you have done that, a society has opened itself up to tremendous vulnerability. And I think that's what's happened right now. The, but the, uh, um, I'm sorry, what was the first thing you, uh, oh, you turn in terms of not, not uh, having a feel good moment. That's an important point. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, you know, I laid it on kind of heavy and then I go a little, I get a little easier going. Uh, at the end, because people do want to know why this white guy got so interested in all this. Um, and it does lighten things up a bit. Um, but I also hope, uh, and I don't want to take it too far, but I also am trying to demonstrate in a way that we can talk about these things, you know, and not get real mad at each other. I don't think anybody's mad at me yet, if so you haven't spoken, but, but we can talk about this stuff. Uh, and, uh, and we can, we can identify our own foibles. You know, I can, I can identify the mistakes that my parents made, um, uh, that, as they related to race, and for sure my grandparents. And I'm not ashamed to talk about it. And I'm not ashamed to talk about the mistakes that I have made, or the ways, the assumptions I made about myself that were wrong, and other people around me. Uh, I can talk about this stuff, we can all talk about this stuff, without getting in a fight about it, or walking out of here hopefully saying, gee, they're, they're all lunatics. And so in some respects, I hope that, uh, that, that that's also part of, part of the value of this sort of a conversation. But I will say, churches, and I don't know what the case is here, but I encounter a lot of churches um, uh, that, you know, either initiated by a white church or a black church, but, uh, you know, once a year or once every four years, they have a joint worship service and, uh, and you know, they eat fried chicken together afterwards or something. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and then that's it. You know, and they feel good about it, and that's it. Um, uh, and... Um, and in fact, I've been invited, I've spoken at some other churches or shown the film and talked uh, 
with churches, and then I've had them invite me back, you know, and sort of, uh, and if, or invite me back more than once, you know, uh, and I finally, my own father was doing that, and the, like the third time, he's trying to get me to come back to this, you know, left-wing, uh, quasi-communist church he goes to in upstate New York. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, father said, look, you know, you got to get past just showing the movie and having you know, me come in and be your trick pony, you know. I'm, uh, you know, do something here, you know. You know, have some different people in the room. Uh, have some conversation about what really ought to be done, and, and I would agree with you on that. Question in the back of the room. Okay. Um, okay. Could you comment on any research and findings related to mental slavery or continued enslavement through negative media representation of black people and music industry, which tends to let degrading, pacifying, and stereotyping messages gain the most popularity or recognition? Well, two things on that. Um, the, uh, I mean, one, I'm, I'm, uh, I urge people to be cautious about the use of the word slavery. Uh, and uh, and I, I think we've gotten a little too flip about that. Uh, you know, I, I've read columns uh, by sports writers saying how the ESPN, uh, the, how the NFL has become a system of slavery um, uh, because, uh, because athletes are locked into these agreements they can't get out of and they don't get the full benefits of their work and all that. And, uh, you know, well, I would take that form of slavery for myself um, uh, if it were made available to me. Um, we're, we can't be cavalier about what is slavery and what's not. And that's not to say that we, you know, there are lots of things that are terrible and we should talk about them and address them and attack them, but, that, but, but because something is terrible doesn't mean it's slavery. So I, 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 it's caught, I, slavery is, is a specific thing. It's when people are forced into labor for someone else at no compensation, uh, that's involuntary servitude, and when they are at risk of being bought and sold, and that's chattel slavery. Um, and, and that's it, that, that's what slavery is. Um, being trapped in an abusive system is, is a terrible thing, but it's, but it's different from slavery. And I'm just a little sensitive about that because uh, I think that if we overuse the word, we end up minimizing these events of the past again, and I, and I, and I don't want to do that. Uh, there certainly was, in terms of the mental and the psychic injury that came with all of these events, uh, it, it was vast, uh, and uh, certainly to the people that it happened to, uh, and the... the yeah, and so, so there is a, uh, there is an emotional echo of all of this uh, that is something that you know that is important to acknowledge and complicated. And I, I certainly don't know, I don't have answers to to all of that, and I don't know how to define specifically some of those things. Um, I also, be honest with you, I, 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 I'm cautious about um, about saying. Uh, the entertainment industry does this, you know, does this, you know, d does these depictions or makes these depictions more popular. And there's a tendency to sort of to think of it sometimes that way. Um, the reality is that uh, people buy the music that they want to hear. Uh, and if we are concerned about that, as I am, I'm concerned about the music that my my 15-year-old son listens to. He's uh, obsessed with rap, um, uh, and uh, and you know, and, and I let him play his music in the car with me, um, in part because I am actually curious to hear it. And there's a lot of it that I think is really cool and creative. And then sometimes things come on, and I say, "That's musical pornography." You know, turn it off. Uh, and uh, and so uh, so I'm concerned about those things too. But um, in my mind, the issue is not the uh, is not the 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 music makers or the, or, or the distribution companies. The, if there's an issue that needs to be attacked, it's an issue in, the, you know, in, the, in, in individuals. And you know, why is it popular and why are people doing it? Why are they buying, why are they buying these things? And, and maybe it's not as terrible as, uh, as we think. You know, every generation seems to think the music of the next generation is subversive and dangerous. Uh, so um, so uh, you know, th 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 those would be my thoughts on all of that. We should get one of these guys in the center after this lady. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll make sorry. These guys have had their hands up for a long yeah, time. Yeah, why, why, why don't we get one? I'm sorry, ma'am, but the, yeah, yeah, these guys have really been diligent. Okay. The 13th Amendment talks about abolishing slavery, but for those who are incarcerated. Do you well, see those who are incarcerated as criminals or as slaves, rather? First question. Next question. From a Eurocentric standpoint, how do you define racism? Wow, those are those are complex and heavy uh, heavy topics. On the uh, on the first one, the uh, 
What the 13th Amendment specifically says is that, that involuntary, slavery and involuntary servitude are abolished um, uh, except as punishment for a crime. That's the, I think that's the, close to the exact words. Um, and, the, uh, and of course, that, and that, that's the loophole that all of this moves through. You know, that, that's what allowed, uh, allowed slavery to persist and to be resurrected. Uh, combined with uh, this also, you'll find this hard to believe when you first hear it, but it's also true that uh, after the 13th Amendment is passed, uh, is adopted, so, so the laws that created the system of slavery, and of course you know, there were hundreds, thousands of laws that related to slavery and governed how slavery worked, um, and so the 13th Amendment abolished that legal system, that structure of slavery, made it where you couldn't operate that system anymore, and you certainly couldn't pass new laws that would govern slavery. But, uh, but the uh, Congress didn't pass a statute, you know, a criminal statute saying, and it's a crime if you do hold slaves. Congress didn't do that. You know, like when, when the 18th Amendment was passed to start prohibition, uh, you, as you may have learned, uh, uh, the, you know, in 1920, when it went into effect, well, the Congress immediately passed the Volstead Act, um, uh, which was the, the set of laws that then would, be, would execute the prohibition of alcohol and the prohibition of the manufacture. Well, there was no Volstead Act as it related to slavery in the 13th Amendment. And so when you get to the early 20th century uh, and, uh, and the federal government finally actually investigates and prosecutes a small number of white people in the early 1900s for still holding slaves or attempts to prosecute them, some of these white guys go into the courthouse and say, uh, and say, slavery's not a crime, you know, I, you know, and they'd been charged under a statute that criminalized debt slavery, where there was a statute that said you can't hold a person against their will to make them pay off a debt, and that's, a, that's peonage, you know, it's a specific thing, uh, and that was, there was a criminal statute on that, and so these guys would be charged with peonage, but then they would come into the courtroom and say, no, 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 he didn't owe me any money, I wasn't holding him to pay off a debt, that would be against the law, I was holding him because I bought him and he was my slave. And, that, and that's not a crime. And, they would, and they'd be acquitted, you know. And in the, in the three or four cases where someone was convicted, they were all pardoned by, by Teddy Roosevelt within a year or so. So, the, uh, um, so uh, that, that is this exception through which this freight train of abuse uh, passes through the 13th Amendment. Uh, and, the, uh, and so, uh, but certainly a person who is, a person who is imprisoned, I mean, by, by the definitions of the 13th Amendment, if you are in prison and you're required to work in prison, uh, then you're being, you're being forced to submit to involuntary servitude. Yes, you are in effect, you're enslaved. That's what the 13th Amendment says is allowed, you know. And uh, now, uh, is that an okay punishment for somebody who really did, did the deed? Maybe, that's a different argument, you know, to, to be forced to make license plates uh, for 20 years, that may be, a, that's involuntary servitude, yes. Uh, it may also be a reasonable punishment for certain crimes. Uh, but if you didn't commit a crime, but the, but the court system is being used to try to create the fiction that, that you did and, and, pun and make you a slave for that, obviously that's what's wrong, and that's what my book's really about. Uh, your uh, racism, the definition of racism. Uh, you know, the, I don't have a highfalutin uh, definition of racism. Uh, you know, one, it's one of those, uh, you know, you know it when you see it, I guess. Uh, uh, but the... Uh, when, and I also think it's gotten more complicated uh, in terms of that, you know, we're, people ask me sometimes, you, almost always white people, uh, will ask me, uh, well, when, okay, this is all well and good, uh, glad you wrote the book, you're, you know, it all matters, you're right, we need to work on all this, but when are we going to get to stop talking about all this? You know, when are we going to finally get there, you know, that, that we don't have to talk about any of this anymore, it's all taken care of? What's that mile marker, you know? And, uh, and I say this a little lightheartedly, but I'm actually serious. I say to them, we will get to stop talking about all of this when we are all light brown, and that day will come. Uh, and, uh, and, so, and so it has gotten complicated because the, you know, there are a lot of shades of color in this room. And, so, um, and there are attitudes and prejudices and perceptions uh, by really light-skinned people like me toward all the somewhat darker people uh, like yourself. There are also a lot of attitudes and prejudices between the slightly darker people uh, from some countries south of us and somewhat darker people. There are attitudes and prejudices between the people uh, of one general ethnicity but who have different colors. You know, the, all of those are racism of a sort, even though we now know that scientifically race is a fiction itself. Uh, 
You know, there really is no, there is no biological definition of race. You know, we're all 99.9 percent .9 identical, and these things on the outside of us are, you know, are, are, are sort of, uh, are tiny details of our of our genetic composition. But um, so I, I, I sort of move beyond the these people are racist about those people, and uh, I'm more about that we're all turning brown. Uh, what country do we want this brown country to look like? Uh, and what's the path to that time and that place that's going to work the best uh, and in which m the most people are going to have the most opportunity? Uh, and that involves a lot of reckoning with the past that does get us back into some of these definitions of how, how we look. Uh, but just like I'm also not interested when, uh, as I'm sure there, would be, there, there may be people in the audience tonight who, had they had the chance, would have said this. Um, uh, and it's a fair thing to say in a way. And that is, uh, somebody stands up and says, well, what does this have to do with me? You know, my, my people didn't own slaves. You know, my, uh, my, my grandparents came over from Germany uh, in, in uh, 1926, you know, and, that's, and they started farming in Wisconsin. And then they moved to Nebraska. Their children did. Uh, and so, you know, they weren't even here when there was slavery, and, uh, uh, and they certainly didn't own any slaves. They didn't have anything to do with slavery, so none of this has anything to do with me. You know, so why should I even care about it? Um, and I think that's just a, uh, you know, that's just an irrelevant, an irrelevant observation um, because uh, it's not about who owns slaves. It's not about who used to be white and now is light brown or, is, or the opposite or whatever. Uh, it's about that as a society, we inherit this burden collectively. Uh, and, and, and that burden is to understand why things are the way they are and to look hard and what would make our country a better place for everybody. And some of that deals with, uh, with repairing the injuries that started off as having to do with race and are still defined by race. Um, but I, I'm just, I'm sort of, I sort of feel like we, we're not in a post-racial era, I don't suggest that. Uh, but I think that we're, we're, we're in a different place, uh, um, at least in my mind, how I look at it. That's probably not a very clear answer, but that's the best I can do. Thank you all so much.